Hello and welcome to The Agenda. I'm Stephen Cole. This week, financing football. Has the beautiful game lost its lustre in the hunt to create more cash? A season of success, but what was it like to win a title in the middle of a pandemic? We'll speak to the chair of Inter Milan, Stephen Zhang. Plus, we'll consider the lasting impact of the collapse of the European Super League. And is the future female? How women's soccer is taking on the world. Over the next four weeks, around two billion people around the world are expected to tune in to Euro 2020. And that's a year after the first ball should have been kicked. Like many other sporting events, not least the Olympics, the pandemic has cost the organisers millions of dollars in ticket refunds. Euro 2020 was supposed to be a celebration of European football, with games being played at venues across the continent rather than in the more usual single host country. But because of organisers' demands that any stadium involved should be at least 25% capacity or more, planned matches in Bilbao and Dublin were cancelled and moved elsewhere. This all comes at a cost to UEFA, European football's governing body, although massive television revenue is still flooding in for the European Championships and the Champions League. In the last year for which figures are available, the year to the end of June 2020, revenue did drop thanks to Covid, but still reached more than 3 billion euros. And it's money which has overshadowed European football this year, following the disastrous attempt to form a European Super League. The hope by a few clubs and their billionaire backers was that the television rights to the new Super League would have been worth billions. Though, of course, as we now know, after just a few days it was announced that the league was dead, killed by a massive backlash from FIFA, UEFA, managers, players and, of course, the fans. But with broadcasters seemingly happy to fork out billions for the rights to show football matches, it seems unlikely that the idea of some kind of new European league has gone away forever. Just this year, England's Premier League renewed its television deal for 2022 to 2025. The cost? More than $6.8 billion. But the next big problem for European football, owners, officials, players and fans alike, comes next year. In an attempt to avoid the stifling heat of a Qatari summer, the World Cup in 2022 will be held in November and December, and that slap bang in the middle of Europe's domestic seasons. That decision may come to be seen as a pointless own goal by FIFA, and quite what impact it'll have on football's spreadsheet is still very much open to question. So let's get a view now of the current state of the beautiful game. And for that, I'm joined by Stephen Zhang, the chairman of Inter Milan, recently crowned Serie A champions. Uh, Mr Zhang, Inter has now become the first foreign-owned club to win Serie A. How does that make you feel? Of course, I'm, I'm really proud. You know, it's, it's a special moment for everybody, for the people in the club, for the fans, for the city. Uh, having a really strong competitor for the past nine years and having them winning uh, in a row. And at the same time, you know, the last time we won was actually about 11 years ago, uh, having an important title, important trophies. Um, it shows that the work that we are uh, been working on in the past five years uh, on, the, on the right track, on the right ways. And obviously uh, seeing the city are so happy, the fans are so happy on the streets. It's something really um, satisfying. The shame is the fans couldn't be inside the stadium. What has COVID meant uh, for you at, at such a great club with not having the fans in the stadium? Uh, and what has it meant for international football, do you think? Unfortunately, uh, COVID and the whole pandemic situation really changed the landscape of football, really impact a lot of industry who are related to offline services, offline experience, um, the consumers, the consumptions, that's which is related to um, physical or, or in-person um, experience. So football or sports industry is one of the industry or fall into that category. So without the fans in the stadium, uh, without experiencing 
uh, seeing the game in person um, or closing a lot of stores, restaurants, eventually damaged a lot to our industry. If you look at um, only 1920 season alone, the overall European football industry lost 2 billion or 3 billion euros. So if you combine that with two seasons, that's double, which is around five or six billions uh, overall in terms of damage for many, many clubs or people who are related to the football industry. So obviously that's gonna be something not gonna be recovered uh, anytime soon. So for us, uh, for the competition, the quality is definitely uh, not gonna be as the same um, before COVID. Um, and all the clubs today, we have to think about how to cutting the costs, how to gonna be still sustainable uh, in the next couple of years when we're recovering from COVID. Um, at the same time, um, how to engage with the fans, or with the audiences who are, were losing in the past couple of years. So how to making sure utilizing the digital platforms, utilizing the social medias, utilizing the fans who are not able to travel, who are not able to see the players, the games in the stadium. Um, that's the key topic or key conversations that we're having. But of course, at the same time, there are some things were we'll built up even before COVID, which in terms of cost structure, in terms of a system, sustainability of the football club. So eventually it forced us, uh, even after COVID, to introducing new products, uh, new changes into our system, and then testing the water to see what our consumers or fans would like to, to see. It sounds like a, a real period of change for you, or projected change. I mean, COVID was one very big issue, and you've listed some other issues as well, uh, especially the digital uh, issues to reach the fans. But there was also the issue of the European Super League, wasn't there? Do you think um, uh, that will be tried again in the future? I think overall, um, this whole incident shows that we have to work in with FIFA and UEFA to really improving the quality of the games, uh, to understand what other changes we need in the market and to listen to the fans and understand what other things that will be providing a better experience for the fans. Um, but pandemic and the COVID situation really pushed us to see um, you know, these changes or innovations are needed in the market. Um, doesn't matter what kind of format, doesn't matter in what kind of ways, but eventually understanding um, you know, the, the market, understanding the current uh, situation after COVID uh, and really making sure we're able and be brave to adapt the changes and changing the whole football system and improving the system is needed. So you're trying to find ways of retaining uh, your fans' attention, or in fact, or, or getting new fans, but in a younger demographic. Is, is, are course. you worried that you're losing fans to digital media? I think it's a competition that for all the entertainment industry, sports industries, um, to really to fight with each other, competing with each other, to see who can provide the better and each interesting products to our consumers. Um, now we're seeing that obviously the younger generation that I engage with digital assets more. We see that's a competition, but at the same time, it's a way to actually enlarge our fan base because these digital platform actually providing or more chances or access to um, these fans or consumers, which were not able to touch or to see uh, before. So in order to competing on these platforms, we have to make sure as football club or as a sports industry, we can providing or developing the contents which are interesting outside of the 90 minutes. So I think now, obviously, the younger generations are engaging on these platforms more. But slowly, we will see that every single age, uh, different age point will be engaged in these platforms uh, in different ways. So we have to targeting different age groups with different contents or things they will like. Europe's biggest clubs, uh, and you are one of those biggest clubs, certainly not just in Europe, in, around the world, um, and you have supporters all around the world. How vital to Inter 
are overseas markets like China to the future of your club? And where are the opportunities, do you think, for growth? The route overall for a for our club, for Inter, is always rooted to its local audiences, uh, to its local fans, and it's the most, most important part. But as the sports industry going global, as we see that the digital era really bring um, the contents going global, and as it says in our name, Internationale, which means a <laughs> football club representing the culture all around the world, having international inclusive um, idea and concept, uh, we see that mostly even more than 50% of our audiences are actually coming the culture outside of Italy. You know, so definitely China uh, is a very important market and the fans are interested in not only football, but also Italian culture, the information and news that are coming from Milano. So that's the part actually have the strongest growth overall for uh, a European football club at the moment. So I think if you're not only speaking to us, but speaking to any um, sports club in Europe or in other countries, the audience in China is always one of the top priorities. And that's actually something that we want to understand to learn what they need and feeding the information and providing the contents that will be interesting for them who are not able to actually travel all the way to Italy, to Milano to see the games, but actually <laughs> enjoy the contents over their phone or on the internet. Stephen Zhang from Inter Milan, thank you so much for joining us on the agenda. Thank you very much. Thank you. Still to come here on the agenda, we'll be looking ahead to the next World Cup. What will be the true impact of Qatar 2022? Murray, what would you say is a good question? Stephen, I'd say it's one where there's always more than one answer. The Answers Project is a new podcast series from CGTN Europe. With me, Stephen Cole. And me, Mari Beveridge. In each episode, we'll take a complex question. And with the help of some of the world's foremost experts, shine light on some of the answers. So join us for The Answers Project. Available wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to The Agenda. Before the break, we got the perspective from one of Europe's largest football clubs, but for a wider view of the current state of the so-called beautiful game, and especially its finances, I'm joined by Dan Jones. And Dan is head of the sports business group at Deloitte. And Dan, where do you think football currently stands over a year into the pandemic, which has cancelled games, closed stadiums, etc.? I guess you can split it into a bit of a game of two halves. So in the short term, obviously, it's been an acute crisis. Um, there's clearly been more important things going on in the world than football matches getting cancelled or having to be played behind closed doors. But but for the game and for its finances, you know, it's clearly been, as I say, a, a very sharp, acute crisis. However, um, the game has done a good job of coming through and adapting. Uh, getting the, the, the game back on screens and bringing that entertainment to millions and billions of people. And actually what I think that's done is set it up very well for the long term because what the period of the pandemic has proved again is the importance of football in people's lives and the extent to which there's a clamour for it. So even though it's been played out in largely closed stadiums, even though you know the, the games were deferred at the, at the start of the pandemic, we've still seen it continue and continue to play a really important role in society. And because of that, that reaffirms the value that it has. So a short-term crisis, but a long-term reconfirmation of the value of football. And of course, European football has also had a tumultuous year, not least the European Super League. What's the lasting effect of that, can I call it, fiasco? Yeah, I think fiasco is probably a, an appropriate term for it. I think... Um, the European Super League was an idea that had been around for 25 years or so um, and I think was always there in the background as sort of the, uh, the spectre at the feast um, used to ensure that um, UEFA um, stepped up to the mark for the, for the bigger clubs and the bigger clubs uh, got what they felt they, they should do from the, what the European Super League we already have, which is the European Champions League. Yeah. And what the, um, the situation a couple of months ago showed was that actually 
it wasn't as well thought through and as well prepared as people might have feared. And also, it was incredibly unpopular. Now, particularly so in England, but, but also elsewhere across Europe as well. So, so I think that the threat of the European Super League in that sense has proceeded and it has empowered and emboldened uh, some of the people who are looking at making other changes to the game uh, to maybe redress some of what they would see as its successes. So from a personal point of view, I was surprised how poorly thought through and poorly executed um, this idea that supposedly had been in the works for 20 plus years was. I noticed you say it's receded. Uh, has it gone away? I don't think you could ever say it, it's totally gone away. Um, but I think if you look at what's happened since, um, you look at the distance that most of the clubs who were originally scheduled to participate in it have put between themselves and it. And obviously there's three clubs who still are, are sticking to the concept. But you, you look at how very, very quickly it mobilised and unified the entirety of football against one thing, which is, which is hard to do. You know, it's hard to unify football in that way at that speed against something. It has to be something really... Um, poorly thought of to do that. So I think it's probably um, less likely than it has ever been through the fact that someone had actually, you know, raised it and surfaced it for the for the first time after it being sort of a, a sort of veiled threat that was hanging in the background for so long. Football is uh, a big business. Lots of money washing around. Most of it comes from television. Does television have too much power, do you think, over the game? Well, I think it's an interesting relationship, the one between money and football. And, and people say, oh, you know, like it's all become about the money and it's not about the football anymore. It's all about the money. It's not about the fans anymore. But, but you've got to look back at where does that money come from? Why is that money there? And the reason the money is there is because fans, you know, want to be associated with football, want to watch football. They, you know, it is their live appointment to view, great unscripted drama that is a key part of their life. So... TV is only interested because it brings a big audience and it aggregates an audience and gets it there live in a way that in a very fragmented um, world, it's e it harder to do than it's ever been. Sponsors only want to put their money towards it because there's that audience. The fans are still going through the gates. The people are still buying the shirts, etc. So, you know, it is still coming all the way back to the fans. That's where all the value comes from. And in terms of it not being about the football, well, the, the football works for those fans and for those broadcasters and sponsors because it is a fantastic piece of entertainment. So I think that the money is an inevitable consequence of those things, not the thing uh, you know, at, at the forefront. So yes, the game's got more money than it's ever had. And yes, it has some challenges, but it's a reflection of the strength of the game, the strength of the public passion for it, uh, and the strength of it as a, as a form of entertainment. Is there an issue yeah. then in where that money goes? Uh, and it's obviously going to the top clubs. Uh, is enough filtering down the lower leagues to the minnows? So that's a really interesting point. So inevitably, um, most of the, you know, the more money goes to the bigger clubs and the more successful clubs and the more successful players than it does to the less successful ones. And I think, you know, everyone agrees and understands that, uh, that that's the right thing. You know, it is a it is a meritocracy. You know, it's a uniquely, I, I think, in a lot of ways, meritocratic sort of pursuit sport. You know. It, in normal jobs, if someone uh, in, you know, uh, the UK is significantly better at a job than someone in Canada, it's very, very hard to tell that because very few people will actually see. Whereas in something like sport and in football, you know, your performance is there for the world to see every single time you go out to do your job. So it, inevitably the rewards gravitate towards those who are the best, whether those are the, the trophies or the money. And, and that's right. The question is, you know, how do you distribute that money in such a way that the whole of the structure, the whole of the pyramid of football is sustainable? And taking England as an example, you know, there's more money in the English game than there ever has been. And that is the case at all levels. So there is more money, more revenue at every single level of the English game than there has ever been. But the gaps between the top and the rest are bigger than they've ever been as well. And so that is a, you know, it's always a very active and delicate debate as to how, um, revenue gets distributed but clearly it's good to have more revenue rather than less when you're looking to distribute it. Dan Jones, head of the Sports Business Group at Deloitte, many thanks for joining us on the agenda. Thank you. So what exactly is next for 
the beautiful game. And what effect is next year's Winter World Cup in Qatar going to have on football? With me now is Laura McAllister, former professional footballer turned administrator and professor at Cardiff University. Um, Laura, you're the deputy chair of UEFA's Women's Football Committee. You stood for election to FIFA's council, as well as being former captain of the Wales women's national team. Uh, it's not ungallant of me to say you've been around the game for a while now. What's your current take on the state of football? I think it's pretty mixed. Um, I'm an optimist by nature, so I can see lots of positives about football at this point in time particularly the growth of the game amongst girls and women. It's an area that lots of nations, not just within UEFA, but across FIFA, across the world, have prioritised. And I think that's very encouraging that we're reaching out to countries that perhaps hadn't really had any infrastructure for developing the game for both sexes. It sounds ridiculous, doesn't it, that you know we've, we've laboured on with the game being so dominated by um, boys and men. But um, unfortunately, that's a truth. But what it does... Uh, do is give a lot of headroom for growing the game amongst girls and women. So that's a positive. I'm afraid I'm less optimistic about the men's game, certainly at professional, senior professional level, mainly because I think there's been a polarisation of some of the very top clubs, uh, and that was exemplified in the um, proposed breakaway European Super League. But I think that kind of disconnect between the top professional men's clubs and the rest of the game has become ever more pronounced, and that worries me um, for a whole host of reasons. But I, but I do think there's still cause for great optimism because, in many respects, football is the simplest game that anyone can play in any sport anywhere across the planet. It's a game that could be played in a small village in Africa or in an urban city in the Americas. So, you know, in some respects, we've got the asset of having simplicity and global appeal, historic global appeal. So if you put all of that together, I think there's more reasons to be optimistic than pessimistic. Well, you started your answer saying you're less optimistic about the men's game. Uh, is that down to the uh, race for cash and the beautiful game losing a little bit of its luster uh, in this race for profits by the billionaire owners? I think there's a lot in that question, <laughs> Stephen, to be honest. I mean, you know, we, we know that it would be naive to suggest we can roll back from where football is now as a, as a global sport. But I think its ownership and its governance can certainly be improved and improved in a way that would benefit the game and benefit all of the people involved in the game, the so-called stakeholders, to use the jargon of these things. But, you know, it's back to my point about the appeal and the profile and the reach of football. I mean, every child um, could potentially be hooked by the game. The reason they're not is because the opportunities to have fun through the game are probably not sufficiently developed. And I do think, actually, the relationship between the grassroots of the game and what you've described as being greed or avarice amongst owners of the top clubs is connected. Because if you take your eye off the ball, excuse the pun, but if you take your eye off the, the football and start thinking purely about elite success and not really investing in the grassroots, whether that's the community game in you know, if you take a, a big club like Manchester United or Real Madrid or uh, Paris Saint-Germain, you know, if there isn't a, a, a base or foundation of success amongst young children playing the game, we're not going to recruit our next Ronaldo or our next Gareth Bale or our, our next Mbappe. And I think we have to have those conversations. You know, we can't allow the very top clubs to depart too far from what we would call the football pyramid because it's, it's a principle of solidarity, it's a principle of investment, and it's a way of ensuring that the game not only survives, but, but flourishes and develops further and reaches out more. The next big issue, uh, Laura, is next year's World Cup in Qatar. It's attracted, the decision to go to Qatar, attracted controversy right from the beginning. And it'll have a massive impact on the European game as it's happening in December for the first time. It is do you think a World Cup in Qatar a good idea? My instinctive answer to that is that it's fraught with difficulties. But but you know let's let's not make any you know great claims here before the event. It seems to me that the decision was made to take the World Cup to Qatar. We have to now see whether that can be done in a safe and sustainable and um, let's be honest, equality-driven way, so that the game's image is not um, damaged. 
But, you know, let's be fair, there were... I think you're being optimistic about an equality way, to be honest. Well, I mean, I, I'm not being optimistic or pessimistic because I'm asking the question rather than giving the answer. You know, I think equality is a fundamental principle of, of football, certainly in Europe. And you, you look at the UEFA values and equality is right at the very heart of it, respect and equality. So I think it does challenge us, really, to make sure that we don't lose sight of our values in the game. Um, but, you know, my point was going to be as well, there were similar misgivings over handing the World Cup to Russia on a similar basis in some regards back in 2018. And I think we do need to revisit some of the criteria by which major tournaments are allocated. Um, maybe it's about a grading and making sure that, you know, financial advantage and resource put in isn't the driving force alone, that we are mindful of the values and the ethics of the game and that we want to make sure that the game will be open not only to all players but to all fans as well. So that's not being naive because I understand exactly what the political and cultural difficulties are in holding a World Cup in Qatar, but we are where we are and now I think whatever happens next year, next winter, um, we'll need to really re revisit this and make sure that it is um, a tournament that continues to reflect all that's good about the game um, rather than undermine some of its fundamental principles. And lastly, uh, Laura, uh, how close uh, is Wales to winning Euro 2020? <laughs> oh, that's a nice thought, isn't it? Yeah, as we prepare for our first game on Saturday against Switzerland. Look, you know, I, I was out in um, in France for Euro 2016, and you know, let's remember Wales did better than any of the home nations in that tournament, reaching the semi-finals. But it's going to be a big ask. Laura McAllister, former professional footballer, many thanks to you for joining us on the agenda. Thank you. I'm not much of a football fan. Rugby is more my game. But even I could see the brilliance and the wizardry of the Brazilian footballer Pelé. When he wrote his autobiography, he called it My Life and the Beautiful Game. He wrote that football was beautiful because it gave people a feeling of joy and passion and taught youngsters to trust and encourage people. Forty years later, is that still the case? Maybe not. Some think football is being overshadowed by money. The top three big football earners, topped by Cristiano Ronaldo, earn up to $100 million a year. Ronaldo, $105 million, Lionel Messi, $104 million, and Neymar, $95 million. Huge sums. The paying supporters haven't mattered a jot since the formation of the Premier League in 1992. The money is all from television and merchandising. And the clubs, well, there's always local interest, but it's been half a century since local lads turned out. Take Arsenal in North London in the UK. It's owned by an American, managed by a Spaniard, and fields only around three British-born players per game at most, and none of them from North London. That's the template. These clubs are money-making franchises. And money was behind the, for now, failed plan for a Super League. But those of us who have long regarded the top end of the beautiful game as a snake pit of grasping owners, overpaid players and dubious agents watched with wry amusement as this shameless money spinner fell apart. But I also think the launch was mishandled. There's no doubt, with money being the big driver it is, inevitable that this Super League idea will be back and will come to pass sooner or later. Fans, of course, will stay loyal to one club, regardless of how they're treated. The emotional bond is too strong. And that's the real beauty of the beautiful game. Don't forget you can watch everything from past Agenda episodes and find additional exclusive content on our website, cgtn.com slash Europe, or on our YouTube channel. And, of course, you can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram at CGTN Europe. Coming up on a future agenda, we'll be considering the fallout from the first in-person meeting of the G7 leaders since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. But for now, from me, Stephen Cole, and all the agenda team here in London, it's goodbye.